Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, we're glad you've all had your break, and this is program number three. For those of you out in television, I think most of you understand we make four programs in a row, and this is the third one now today, and uh, one more, and we can head back home. Okay, again, we just want to thank you so much. My, I just asked Cheryl again this morning. I said, Cheryl, is the bank account okay? And she said, nothing to worry about. So we just praise the Lord because you got to remember, most of our contributions are 25, 50 bucks, and uh, that takes a ton of people to uh, keep us on the air. And all we can do is just say thank you and thank you, Lord because uh, the response is just phenomenal. And I think I shared it with you a while back that I think we came to the conclusion that most of our primary responders are men. We are reaching so many men from 25 to 75 years of age who never had spiritual interest and uh, they're just elated and they just, they, they just can't say it enough of how everything has changed their lives. Now, I don't take credit for it. It's the Lord that does it. But nevertheless, we've been the vehicle that the Lord has seen fit to use. So continue to pray for us and uh, pray for our listening audience that hearts will be open because uh, I'm so confident in what we teach because we simply take what the book says. And in fact, I guess I can give an illustration here before we start. I had a gentleman call from, I think it was uh, West Palm Beach, Florida some time ago, and uh, a very devout religious young man, 42 years old. He said, I have never missed going to church. He said, I've always been devout. But he said, today's program, the first time I've ever seen your program, he said, by the end of the program, I was a believer. I was out of my dead religious church. And he says, now don't get the big head. You didn't do it. It was the Word of God that was on the screen. And he said, never before had I read one word from the Bible. But I don't know what verses it was we used, but the Lord directed to his heart. And you know, it doesn't take six months to get saved when God is in it. And uh, so these are the kind of responses we get and uh, we do. We just give the Lord the credit for all of it. Okay, let's just pick up where we left off now in our series for however long it takes. When God moves in with the three-letter word B-U-T, but God, or but Noah, or but now. Now we're looking at the book of Ruth today at this point in time, Ruth chapter 1, and we got much the same scenario as we had in Genesis 6. It's, but Ruth. So go down with me to verse 14, and then we'll go back and look at the background. The little book of Ruth, chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth cleave or hung on to her, her mother-in-law. Well, by itself, that doesn't tell us much, so we need background, don't we? All right, now when you go back through chapter 1, and we're not going to take time to read it all verse by verse, but anyhow, this little Jewish family of Abimelech and Naomi and their two sons, Malon and Chilion, had left Israel because of hard times and famine in the land of Israel, and they went down into Moab. Now, if you know your Middle Eastern Old Testament geography, Moab was over on the east side of the Dead Sea and on the southern end. So they either had to go around the south end of the Dead Sea to get to Moab, or they had to go around the north end. But nevertheless, they ended up in that Arab nation of Moab, which was a taboo for Jews. They were having nothing to do with the Moabites. But here we have this Jewish family in complete opposition to the laws of Israel finding themselves down in Moab. All right, now then, we find that after they get to Moab, verse 3, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, up and what? He dies. Now Naomi is left alone with her two sons, see? All right, so she was left with her two sons, 
And they, contrary again to all the laws and traditions of Israel, married Moabite women. See? All right, so verse 4, they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years, which in any period of time is a long time. All right, so now then, the ten years go by, verse 5, and Malan and Chilion both die. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So she arose with her daughters-in-law, both of them. She leaves with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard the country of Moab, how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. In other words, the famine had ended up in Israel and things were prospering once again. So now she sees fit to go back to her homeland and with the idea that she would leave her daughters-in-law in Moab. All right. Verse 7, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah, which of course is the southern area of Israel. It's the area around Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And now verse 8, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead, that is, her sons, and with me. Verse 9, The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, they lifted up their voice and wept. Now after all, you know, they've been family for ten years or more. Verse 10, And they, the girls of Moab, Ruth and Orpha, and they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people, that is, the Jews, Israel. But Naomi said, verse 11, Turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight, I should also bear sons. Verse 13, would you tarry for them? Now you want to remember some of these old customs in antiquity were beyond our imagination because they would. They would ne necessarily wait for a replacement son to be born and finally become a husband to replace one that's been lost. That's beyond our thinking, but that's the way they did it. All right, so now then, she says in verse 13, Would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law. She's going to go back home to Moab. But Ruth, but Ruth. Now listen, there's more there than meets the eye. Because where does Ruth end up? In the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Ruth becomes part and parcel of the line of David. And so who's behind it all? The sovereign God. Isn't it amazing? He's in control of even marriage relationships. And here we have a woman from a taboo place such as Moab, yet by God's grace she comes into a relationship with a Jewish family. And so she and her mother-in-law, two widows now really, go back to the homeland of Israel. All right, now then, verse 16. <coughs> Ruth said, <coughs> Contrary to what Naomi is insisting, <coughs> Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following thee. For where you go, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people, Israel now remember, thy people shall be my people. And here's the crowning part of all. Thy God shall be my God. Now, who was the god of Moab? Idols. They were idolaters. They had no knowledge of the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so here comes this pagan lady, Ruth, embracing the god of Israel again by faith. 
and goes on then to promise, where thou diest, verse 17, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part you and me. And when she, was, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, <clears throat> she left off speaking with her, and the two went until they came to Bethlehem. Now you all know, of course, that Bethlehem is one of the key little towns in all of Israel, the house of bread. And so it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? And she said of them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. <clears throat> I went out full, the Lord hath brought me home empty. Well, that's what she thought, but she didn't come back empty. She came back with a daughter-in-law that would fall right in line with the line of King David. <clears throat> So verse 22, Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Now then, I think you all know the story of Ruth, how that they had no real means of support, so Ruth becomes a gleaner in the grain fields. And one of the fields that she happened to glean in was the, the field of Boaz, who was a next of kin. And so when the time comes for God's providence to be put into play, Ruth not only becomes a gleaner in the field of Boaz, but actually ends up being his wife. And then, of course, from the line of Boaz and Ruth, we have, I think if I remember correctly, Obed, and then Jesse, and then King David. But the point is, it wasn't just human beings operating under their own free will, but who's behind it all? The God of creation. And I don't think it's a bit different today. I think that we're left to the free will. Everything that happens isn't God directing us like a puppet, and yet He is so aware of every facet of our life that He can control it in His own way of controlling. You know, I always remind people, if you're a believer today, just look back, and can you see how God has been maneuvering things all the way along? Of course He does. And it's beyond our comprehension how God can leave us with a free will and yet get us exactly where He wants us. So remember this, that not only was it but Noah, not only was it but God in the case of Joseph, <clears throat> but now even in the case of this Moabitess young lady, but Ruth, by providential guidance, stayed with her mother-in-law and then became part of the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go to another one of these key buts in Scripture. Let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 3. 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 3. And we're going to come up now to King David. <clears throat> and again, for a little recap, when the tabernacle was constructed out in the wilderness during those 40 years, they carried it from place to place by taking it down, of course, and with staves were able to carry it on the shoulders of men. And so the tabernacle makes its way all the way up to an area north of Jerusalem. And King David, with all of his power and his pomp and his circumstance, was always rather upset that the house of God at which Israel worshipped was still just a little tent up there in the mountains. And how much more appropriate would it be to have that in a beautiful temple, I suppose, much like the pagan temples of David's day. And so it was just a heart desire of David to build a temple that could house the Ark of the Covenant. All right, so now then we come up to 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and down to verse 3 and we find our two key words again. And what are they? But God. King David had power, he had pomp, he had wealth, but God. All right, let's jump back then to verse 1. <coughs> and 
And David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course. In other words, that's what I mean by pomp and circumstance. All of his servants that waited on him were just surrounding him because after all he was the king and his military leaders, his captains, see? And then reading on down, the stewards of all the substance and the possession of the king. Now, I don't think I have to remind you, David was at the pinnacle of Israel's history. Solomon takes it a little further, but David is the one who brought Israel to the very peak of her historical significance as a nation among the nations. All right, and so they're practicing much the same thing that the Gentiles around them. And so all the substance and possession of the king and of his sons and with their officers and with the mighty men and with all the valiant men, valiant men they come to Jerusalem. <coughs> now verse 2, Then David the king stood up upon his feet and he said, Hear me, my brethren, my people, as for me, with all of my power, as for me, I had in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. He had everything at his disposal. He had the wealth. He had the manpower. He had already bought the threshing floor from the Canaanites and he's now ready to build a permanent temple, dwelling place for the Ark of the Covenant and the place of worship of the God of Abraham. Okay, now then, verse 3. But God, God intervenes. And what does He say? Oh, David, not so fast. I'm not going to let you build my temple. Why? Because he'd been a man of war. He had shed blood by the gallons. See? All right, let's read on. But God, he intervenes. The big stop sign. <coughs> thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war, and you have shed blood. Verse 4, how be it? The Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. Now there is a thought-provoking word, isn't it? How long will Israel's kingship go into eternity? For Christ is referred to as the what? The son of David. And so when he returns and sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem, yes, it'll be God the son, but he's still going to be referred to as the son of David. <clears throat> and so when David speaks of his kingship going on into the foreverness of eternity, it wasn't loosely spoken because that's exactly what it will be. All right, verse 4 again then. Howbeit the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler, and of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. Now, not only did David come out of the house of Judah, but who else? Jesus Christ himself is of the house of Judah. And that's why it's a, a likely uh, line of kings from David right on up to the Lord himself. All right, now then, verse 5, And all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many, he hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And so Solomon now then begin, becomes the one that will build the temple for the Lord there in Jerusalem. But again, in spite of all of David's power, in spite of all of his clout, in spite of all of his wealth, who was sovereign? God was. But God intervened, and David couldn't even begin to lay the first brick of a temple <coughs> because God overruled. <coughs> All right, let's look at the next one before our time is up. Go to with me with Jonah, chapter 4, verse 7. <coughs> Jonah. Now that's going to be a little hard to find. Yeah. Let's go to Jonah, 
which is Daniel, Hosea, Obadiah, if I remember correctly. I hope I'm right. No, Amos, I'm sorry. Amos and Obadiah, and there's little Jonah. <coughs> there's Jonah. We're going to jump all the way over <coughs> to chapter 4, verse 7. Jonah, chapter 4, verse 7. You got it? I'll find it. Daniel, Hosea. And what was the next one? Thank you, honey. Jonah, chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 7. What's the first two words? But God, <laughs> of all places, <clears throat> here in this little book of Jonah, but God, what does that mean? Again, he moves in providentially. Contrary to good human sense, God does something that would seem ridiculous. But what's he doing? He's teaching a lesson, even through the acts of this man Jonah. All right, now we have to go all the way back again and recap. What had happened? Well, God had instructed Jonah to go to this wicked Gentile city of Nineveh and preach salvation to them. But now remember, I've been stressing over the years of my teaching. When God was dealing with Israel, what was to be their attitude to the rest of the Gentile world? They were to have nothing to do with them, as we saw with Ruth. <clears throat> they were not to intermarry with the Gentiles. They weren't try to evangelize them. <clears throat> they were to have nothing to do with them socially, spiritually. It was strictly a taboo. But okay, now in the case of Jonah, what does God do? He said, Jonah, I want you to go to that wicked city of Nineveh, and I want you to preach to them. Now imagine Jonah had the Old Testament mentality that the Twelve had in the New Testament. So let's go up to the New Testament before we look at Jonah. <clears throat> go up to Matthew, chapter 10. And see, people are shocked when they see this verse, <clears throat> especially since it's from the lips of the Lord Jesus Himself. I've had people call and tell me they showed it to their preacher and it made him mad. <laughs> they don't want to believe this. Well, then they've got problems because it's the Lord Himself that's speaking. And look what He says, Matthew 10. Now remember, I got Jonah in the back of my mind, and I want you to have Jonah in the back of your mind because nothing has changed. This was the mentality of Israel from day one. All right, Matthew 10, at the beginning of His earthly ministry, Jesus has just chosen the twelve. Now verse 5. So these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. See that? Don't you have a thing to do with Gentiles? And even the Samaritans, who were half-breed Jews, enter not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's the way it was from the day that Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees have nothing to do with those Gentiles around you. Now, you see, the reason was the whole then known world's population was steeped in vicious, satanic idolatry. And God knew that if He would permit His chosen people to begin to intermarry and intersperse and have intercourse with them through whatever area of life, it would destroy the nation's spiritual purity. And so they were to have nothing to do with the Gentile world. All right, now then let's go back to Jonah. Jonah is a good Jew who has been told and taught to have nothing to do with the Gentile. And yet here the Lord says, verse 2 of chapter 1 in the little book of Jonah, 
<clears throat> Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, Gentile city, and cry against it. Why? For their wickedness is come up before me. But God in grace now is going to send a Jew with a message of salvation. All right, now verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish. Now Tarshish, I think most agree, was probably a reference to Spain at the western end of the Mediterranean. Nineveh is east. So when God tells Jonah to go east to Nineveh, Jonah, thinking he's a good obedient Jew, goes west on the Mediterranean. And you've heard me refer to this over and over. And when he gets out there on the Mediterranean and the ship starts having trouble, Jonah would rather walk the plank as go to a Gentile city. And that was the typical Jewish response. But again, it's going to, God is going to intervene, see? And so Jonah now, after being swallowed by the great fish and is spit up on the shore, a picture of death, burial, and, resur and resurrection, of course, and he goes to Nineveh. All right, and he preaches salvation. And again, the Lord told him in chapter 3, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I made. So verse 3, so Jonah arose, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was exceeding great city, a three days journey, that is a cross. It was one of the biggest cities in the ancient world. All right, and so as a result then of Jonah's preaching, the city of Nineveh repents and is experiencing God's goodness and grace. All right, now then, if you know the story of Jonah, I've got to round this up in 50 seconds. In his pouting response to God's being gracious to Nineveh, he goes out and sits in the heat of the desert sun, but God springs a gourd up. And it becomes an umbrella for him and shields him from the heat of the day. Now then, as he's enjoying the shade of that great gourd, now verse 7, but God... What does he do? He intervenes again sovereignly and he prepares a worm that kills the gourd. Where does that leave Jonah? Without a shade tree. Well, what was the lesson? I think the lesson is no matter which way God is telling Jonah to go or what to do, God is providential and he is sovereign and he can do whatever he wants, including take away his shade tree. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.